told you it wasn't going to be the same kind of service like you would usually be in. I know I can't preach up to Pastor Taylor's level, so I have to do whatever I do. Oh, hallelujah. God's good. Do you feel his presence in the place? See, there was a time whenever we found ourselves stuck in Lodi. Pastor almost said it a while ago. Is that my sermon notes there you got? I'm looking here. I've got a set of notes somewhere. I've laid them down. That's, that's probably them right there. I was anticipating going back to the chair. And I would bring it up here in sections. There we go. Now, the song that we played for you a while ago, Stuck in Lodi, every time I hear that song, I think about a particular scripture. And it changes the word just a little bit to be Lodabar. And I got to looking around and I thought, what was Lodabar? Where was Lodabar? Christopher, there's a, one of the slides in there has a picture of Israel. Can you scan to that one? There's, I went onto the computer and I tried to get a picture of where Lodabar is. And if you'll click it one time for a point of reference, that's Jerusalem. And from the best records and archaeology and all that kind of stuff that they can work it, the next click will show you where Lodabar is located. Somewhere up in the region of a dry air, just a mess. It was such an insignificant place that history doesn't even give us an exact bit of detail about the history of Lodabar. In fact, what we do have is a picture that we believe is the town. And there's not much there. I think the next picture, it's summed up as the, it's the town with no pasture. Now, if you were in the industry of sheep herding, that's not the kind of area that you want to live in because your means of having an income is pretty low on the charts. There's nothing there. But I do tell you, or I can tell you, that this particular town, Lodabar, was known for one thing and one thing only. It had a person living there that was heir to a throne. There was somebody there that had significance in this unsignificant place. And the story that I began to develop out of that goes way back. You would have to go to Joshua, Judges, Ruth. You, all through there, there's some history that I don't have time to unbundle all of it today. But basically, Israel had gone into the promised land. And they were in the process of moving out all of the ites. Now, buddy, if you've ever tried to read through them, that will tie your tongue up. But here they were moving out the ites, Jezebites, Canaanites, Hittites. I mean, the list is on and on and on. And Saul was the king. He had been the anointed or the selected king that Israel wanted whenever they demanded a king. And in the process of one of those battles, Saul had found himself captured. The enemy closing in around him, and he, he asked his armor bearer to kill him, to run a spear through him. The armor bearer wouldn't do it, so Saul fell on his own sword. And the battle ended very, very bad for Israel that day. See, all of that was building up to something before that. I'm, kinda, I'm trying to reverse this story so we can pull all together at Lodabar. What happened was Saul had been the elected king that they, Israel had chose. But there was another little boy named David. Just a shepherd boy. And the great prophet Samuel had gone down to Jesse's house and says, God has sent me down here because you have a son that's going to be appointed king. They went through the lineup. 
God says, not this one, not this one, not this one. They got all the way down to the end that he said, Jesse, I'm going to put it in South Carolina language. Either I've missed God or you hiding somebody on me. You're holding out. He said, well, we got one little boy over there taking care of the sheep. Samuel said, go get him. And he was anointed king of Israel. But how many knows whenever the anointing comes, sometimes there may be a long waiting period where the seed has to germinate until there's a harvest. Little David, caring for the sheep, gets a call from his dad and says, take these crackers and cheese and go down and check on your brothers at the military. And David encounters Goliath. For 40 days, that uncircumcised Philistine had been ridiculing the God of Israel. David looked up at that and he said, something's wrong with this picture. How come somebody hasn't taken care of the problem? I'll go. Give me a rock. He's too big to miss. <laughs> we, I have not been in a situation worse than this. I know I can hit that thing. Think about it. All of those things exalted David up through the ranks until he became friends of the king, Saul. One of the little points that kind of jumped at me, Pastor, whenever I was digging through this is I realized that we know David as, Saul, as Jonathan's best friend. And he was always at the palace because Saul was throwing javelins against the wall at him. Whenever he'd go into his bipolar rages. But what I really didn't kind of understand is that Saul was his father-in-law. He married Saul's daughter Micah. So Jonathan was his brother-in-law. Kind of weird how whenever you break it all down, there's little nuggets in there, you know. Well, you're talking about a family, keep it all in the family thing. Then Saul dies. And David is brought to the forefront. Now, the story kind of goes like this. He had been raised uh, with a knowing that he was going to be the king one day. His best friend should have been the rightful heir. But his friend died. He became the target of Saul's anger. And he had an opportunity to kill Saul. On one of those runs, on several of those runs in those caves, Saul could have been right there in his grasp. But he chose not to, uh, not to touch God's anointed. He finally ascends to the throne and he's in the process now of cleaning out. And what we, in military terms, he was in the process of doing mop up. They were pushing out some of the other little areas, the tribes and people, the territories. And he had a guy in his palace by the name of Ziba. Ziba. However you want to do it with your English, Ziba. And he says to him, he says, Ziba, is there any of Saul's family still living? Now, let's, let me tell you why he said that. In the process of cleaning out and doing this mop up, some of Saul's, I mean, some of David's military guys had gone and caught one of the enemies in bed and cut his head off in bed and then brought the head back to Jerusalem, praising God that they had conquered this thing and David didn't like the way it was done. He gave the guy a, a formal burial. He's trying to be the diplomat. He's trying to be the good guy while they're doing the mop-up, the military stuff. And he finally calls Ziba in and he says, is there any of Saul's family that is still living? Ziba said, yeah, there's one. There's a little guy down in Lodabar. Saul's grandson. His name is Mephibosheth. Well, that's a hard one for a slow-talking southerner to spit out. Mephibosheth. But he's lame on his feet. 
Well, that caused me to have to do some more digging. So I went back to Samuel chapter 4, verses 1 through about 20 there. And it talks about as, the, as Saul was, when Saul had gotten killed, there was a mass exodus from the palace. Evacuate the palace. Well, as the customs were have it back then, the nursemaid that was taking care of Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, Saul's grandson, she dropped him. In the process of fleeing out of the palace, she dropped him and caused him to have an injury that left him lame. And here he was living in Lodabar, a lame man on his feet, but a king somewhere down the road in Jerusalem inquired of Saul's family. You know what that tells me? That's a really nice picture of how God never gives up looking for us. <laughs> Is there anybody of the household? Now, I want you to get this picture of what happened. David sent his military, I'm going to call them henchmen, his, his bodyguard force. Go get him and bring him to the palace. Now, I can imagine whenever Mephibosheth looked out the window and saw the king's men, he said, oh, this is it. I'm the rightful heir to the throne. This is my last day. They're fixing to cut my head off. I'm done. Don't answer the door. <laughs> he could have done what we do sometimes. We don't answer the doorbell. We don't answer the phone. Or we make up a lie about our identity. He could have done all that. But he chose to humble himself and go without a fight. How many of us have lived in Lodabar of our own doings? Some of us live in Lodabar and it wasn't our fault. Some of us got a bad deal. Sometimes bad things happen to good people that we can't explain. I just this week read about one of the Junior Miss or Miss America contestants talking about she was the product of a rape. That's a hard card to get dealt in life. Or we've had students that says, you know, I was not wanted. My parents told me I was an accident. My load of bar means I've lived in foster homes or orphanages or, or I've been rejected and nobody wants me because my parents have divorced and I'm the outsider. Some of us have lived in load of bar at Teen Challenge, we call it the Silver Bar Hotel, where the weight of the law has come down on our heads. There's a host of physical abuse. My God, I can't imagine living in a home where you get slapped or chained to a bolt on the floor or locked into a closet. I can't imagine living in a home where a young girl sleeps with a knife under her pillow waiting for the chance to put it into her dad for the things that he does to her on a regular basis. I can't imagine what human trafficking is doing across this country. But friends, there is a multitude of thousands and thousands of people who are living in Lodabar, a place of insignificance. Nobody knows they're there. Nobody cares they're there. It just seems like there's no hope and no way out. About two months ago, I received a phone call from North Carolina. A young girl calling in desperation because grandma, my grandma gave me a telephone number. And she told me to make some phone calls. And she went on to describe her life and she says, I feel like I'm living in a deep, muddy pit. And I said, honey, do you have a Bible anywhere close in the house? She got a Bible and I directed her to Psalm 40 verse 2. I was in a deep, miry clay, but he brought me out and he established my feet and he set my going straight. 
She began to break down and weep on the other end. My God, there's people in Lodabar this morning sitting in our homes, in our churches, in our schools, in our factories, wherever we live our day. There are people who are living in a Lodabar, and they need to know that there is an answer. We don't have to die there. Here's what happened. Whenever people get that phone call or somebody gives them a brochure, and I've got brochures out here I want you to take with you when you go home. It's very easy for somebody to present to a drug addict hope, and it's met with suspicion. What do you mean, 12 months program? You just want my money. Or they may be in trouble with the law, and the arresting officer says, hey, look, I know about a place that if you'll go, We'll help the judges and we'll get the paperwork right to where you can go and you can start over a new life. It's a legal setup, some say. But what do we do? Do we run? Do we listen to the outside crowd? One of my first heartbreaks was a little boy in Myrtle Beach whenever we were probably 1991 or 92. I had a little boy named Peanut. Strung out on cocaine. He came from the other side of the street. From the hill. Got his medical work done. Got him ready to come in and he disappeared on me. And I said to him, I called him up, I said, Peanut, where are you at? He says, I can't go to your program. My brother says that I can't trust a white man. Like a dagger. No. Peanut. There's hope. There's help. You don't have to live in Lodabar. And he eventually made his way to a program in Florida. And we were able to keep up with him. And he called me later on doing very, very well. The good news is. You can come to an environment that's friendly. David said to Mephibosheth. You come and live at my house. You're lame on both feet. I'm going to give you a whole host of servants. I'm going to give you your inheritance. It says right there that he gave him the land that his his grandfather Saul would have given him in an inheritance. He gave it back to Mephibosheth. He gave him a whole host of servants to wait on him hand and foot to bring his crops in from the fields and to feed him at the meal. And the part I like about it at the end, he says, and you can sit at my table forever. I started to sit down here, but I'd probably be better off if I was standing there. If that cloth, if that table had a tablecloth, the king's tablecloth, and my feet is under that, Can't nobody tell I'm a lame person. (laughs) If I'm covered under his covering, I'm the same as any resident in that house. And that's the good news that we bring at Teen Challenge. When we let Jesus Christ lift us out of Lodabar, I don't have to sing that song, Stuck in Lodabar. I might have come there broke, But I am now a king's kid. His royal blood now flows in my veins. I can be anything God has laid up on me to be. I don't have to go around lame, stuck with a message from the pits of the miry clay. But he has set my feet on a rock. And what happened 31 years ago in this building when that pastor looked at me and he said, my plans is not what you've got planned, but hang on. It's all going to work out. (laughs) Pastor, it's all going to work out. Every one of you leaders in the church, it's all going to work out. Lodabar is a thing of the past. And he lived at the king's table forever.
You teen challenge guys, don't take what the devil says and drag you back to Lodabar. No, sir. We're on a different path now. We're on a path to heaven. Before I came here, I was working at a drug rehab in Alabama named Bradford. And they told people that relapse was part of the landscape. I don't accept that. I don't accept it. I believe that Jesus Christ that hung on the cross, that left his blood on those, that rugged old cross, I believe that that blood was shed so that we can walk victorious and sit at the king's table. Somebody got a witness in the house. Hallelujah. We're moving in on a permanent residence. Some of these guys will be graduating in a couple of months. Others will be coming in. I'm glad to know that we got people lined up to come in, and we're going to be able to share some of that a little bit later on, but God's good. Now, there's a song, and I think you guys sung it around here, Chain Breaker. Come, come on up here, Pastor. Here, in the past, how many has heard the song Chain Breaker? Okay. We've got a friend sitting right here. Jimmy, raise your hand. I want you to go do something. He, is, he restores automobiles. And God laid it on his heart last year or sometime to build uh, an automobile named the Chain Breaker. And he has brought that thing here today on the back of a trailer. I'm going to ask him to go get it and pull it up in this foyer out here. Because in the back of that truck, the planks on the back of that truck is engraved with names of people who have lost the battle to drugs. But I got news for you this morning. There is one in this house that can break the chain of addiction. He's a water walker. Can make you a tongue talker. Set powers at liberty. Bind up the devil. There's a whole lot of things that can happen around here today. And I'd like for you to stand. And we're going to promote Teen Challenge. We always try to do that. We've got a table outside. But I'm not here about the money right now. We do want to say thank you for the support that comes from this church. It's one of the ways that we make our bills and pay our bills. We do have, I will tell you this, that every time a student comes in, we know that that's $18,000 that we have to raise that year for them. So your offering today will go to support us, to help us to keep this ministry going. It's grown now from our first budget figures of $3,200 that first month to uh, $350,000 a year. It's a heavy load, but I got a good God. My daddy got plenty of money. We saw him build buildings and bring staff, and now we're going to another level. Don't have time to go into all that this morning. But there is a God who loves you. Can I challenge you if there's one in this building that's been living in Lodabar? I don't know what your Lodabar is. But I know one thing. Jesus can change that. And if you'd like for us to pray for you, I'll guarantee you these guys will come out of where they're at. They will meet you here at the altar today. And you can experience that transfer from Lodabar to God's kingdom. Let's pray. Father, I know that the enemy would try to tie things up. He would try to make us to say, oh, you are right. But Lord, there could be individuals here today that would love to walk away from Lodabar and never have to sing that song, Stuck in Lodabar. So I'm asking you now, Lord, that as we are standing here, and if there's anybody in this building, from front to back, old to young, male, female, whatever, if you'd like for somebody to pray with you about anything that's going on in your life, and you'll come down here, I'll guarantee you my guys will come and stand around you, and they'll pray for you. They'll pray with you. Is there anybody that would like to come to have prayer? I would love to think that 
we all live in utopia and everything's great. But I know what the facts are. Some of you may have grandchildren, children, husbands, wives that desperately need help. We are here to provide you the information, phone numbers, literature. If you'll stop and see us back there, the guys have, we have, we've created, we've printed some uh, Bible markers and there's a space on the back of it where they can write their name. And if any of you would like to get one of those at that table back there, our guys are prepared to where they can, uh, they'll write their names on there so that you'll pray for them as they go through the program. You'll keep us in prayer and we appreciate so much the opportunity of coming here and sharing today. Pastor Charles, you're a blessing to us. God bless you. I'm finished.